Thank you. Thank you. It's always good to know who my audience is. So I want to ask for a quick show of hands. How many of you in the room are 50 or above? How many of you plan to be 50 or above? <laughs> That's very good. Those of you that didn't put up your hand for either, you can leave now. This probably isn't relevant for you. <laughs> in 1931, Aldous Huxley wrote this uh, now famous uh, classic text. It was written as a satire, but it's all too often taken quite seriously. So you can read it in, in two ways, uh, and it can be humorous. Uh, as a satire, it can be quite, uh, quite depressing if you take it too seriously. Uh, one of the things I want to pick up on uh, that, as I, when I reread this book recently was that uh, there's a moment in the book when, um, uh, when some, a woman and her son come back from the reservations. They're considered savages. Uh, they haven't lived in, uh, uh, in the real Brave New World for some time. Uh, the son is considered quite an oddity uh, and considered quite interesting. Uh, society flocks to him. Uh, they want to understand uh, what his life was like and, and how he plans his new life to be. But the woman, uh, the mother, uh, is actually shunned. Why is she shunned? Not because she's a savage, not because she came from the reservations, but because, and I quote, she'd lost her youth. She was considered disgusting, and literally no one wanted to have anything to do with her. I start with this point because this is actually something that unfortunately we see all too often in our society, but why is age shunned? Why is age or older age considered such a negative? Well, um, on a slightly different note, not necessarily an order subtly classic, but a YouTube sensation uh, that went around the internet not that long ago highlights this point quite well. Just a few minutes of this video. I don't hear it clicking, do you? Do you hear it clicking? No. Then there's something wrong. We're doing something wrong. Here it is. Oh, we gotta wait. Here. 16, 15, 14, 13. Here, get closer. <laughs> Did you hear a click? Did you hear a click? No. It goes on. <laughs> It goes on for a few more minutes, but again, we can take that one of two ways. We can laugh, as many of us did, or we can actually see the serious side of this. Uh, just last year, the Human Rights Commission, uh, the Australian Human Rights Commission, released a report on age discrimination. They surveyed uh, particularly the media and the media perceptions or, or the messages that were sent out about older people, and these are some of the words they came up with. Worthless, angry, sad, useless. This is how older people are portrayed, particularly in our media. And this is not necessarily something we should laugh at for a couple of reasons. It's simply not the truth. It's not helpful and it's not the truth. When researching my latest book, which was a fascinating project, one of the most interesting things I've worked on for a few years, I came across some of these statistics. This is the truth. This is what's really happening, which is quite in contrast to some of those words we saw up there and the ways, the messages that are sent out, particularly in our popular media, about older people. They're not necessarily old and useless and a burden on society. In fact, quite the opposite. The majority of older people, not just in Australia but around the world, are functional, are healthy, are happier. There's a significant body of research now, several very well controlled, very well conducted studies that show that happiness can actually increase with age. Why? Well, there's a number of reasons for that. One, we actually become a bit more comfortable in our own skin. Two, we don't care as much what other people think. How nice would that be? I can't wait to get to that stage. <laughs> <laughs> But a number of people, significant number of older people, are healthier, happier, working, functioning, living, fulfilling lives. But we just don't see this. We don't see it as often as we would like. And it's something that I'd like to, to remedy um, in, in my new campaign to promote positive ageing. So when I did the research, this is more the reality of what I came across. So we, 
we can see these are just examples of living, breathing, real people. And it's actually interesting, you know, when you become aware of something, you start seeing more of it in the world. So I actually started looking for more older people playing rock and roll music, and I've actually found a couple of septuagenarians playing actually the same song that we just heard there. Jagger, 70. Keith Richards, 70. The Rolling Stones, I just read this morning, the highest grossing band in the world. Closely followed by U2, who are not necessarily spring chickens themselves. But these guys are still out there living fulfilling, active, very functional lives, pleasing millions of people in their 70s. And look, it's not just famous rock stars. Again, when I was researching and writing my book, I was privileged, absolutely privileged enough to interview. Uh, some amazing people, some particularly uh, some local heroes uh, in Australia, as well as reading about people all around the world who are achieving similar goals. Uh, Frank Dern is a guy I met through my brother. My brother's a, um, uh, well, he's semi-retired now, but uh, due to niggling injuries. Uh, but he used to be a very, very keen runner, and he was part of a group in Sydney called the Sydney Striders, a big running club. When he found out I was writing this new book, he, um, he said, look, you've got to meet Frank. You have to interview him. He's a legend. Uh, and thankfully, I did uh, interview Frank, uh, and he is a legend. The week before I interviewed him, he's in his 80s, in his early 80s, the week before I interviewed him, he just completed yet another marathon. He's run something like 20 marathons, multiple half marathons, uh, the six-mile track, which is a, a, a more than a marathon length through the bushland with near vertical climbs. He still gets up and runs every single day. Maggie Beer, who many of you might know, uh, the queen of culinary uh, pursuits in Australia, she actually spoke at one of these conferences just a few years ago. One of the most passionate, uh, pleasurable, uh, lovable people that I've ever met. She just exudes happiness and, and enthusiasm. Uh, Maggie is 70, and she's still running a, a, a business empire uh, around this world and, and making, making amazing changes. One of her latest projects, actually, is getting quality food into aged care homes. Uh, Maggie equates uh, uh, food not just with nutrition, uh, but quality food equates to the quality of life. Uh, and she's very, very concerned, quite rightly, with the lack of quality food in some of our nursing homes, etc. Paul Clitheroe, who some of you may know, one of, the, one of this country's most famous and uh, most uh, highly regarded uh, financial experts, uh, one of the founders of the IPAC financial advisory firm, um, he's just turned 60. When I rang up Paul uh, to try and organise an interview for this book, he said, yeah, I'd love to help you out, Tim, but it'll have to be in a few weeks because I'm about to go and climb Mount Kilimanjaro. A true story. But these guys, this is just three, and there's many, many more that I interviewed and, and many more examples from the research. These people in their 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s are still doing amazing things and there's no reason that all of us can't achieve the same sorts of things. And what I noticed when I spoke to these people was a phenomenon made famous many, many years ago uh, called the psychology of possibility, uh, highlighted particularly by Ellen Langer's research. And this is uh, actually made most famous by a study that was conducted in 1979, became famously known as the counterclockwise study. What did she do? Well, in 1979, she took a bunch of, for a variety of reasons, it was uh, older men, 70-year-old men, and they, put the, they, they, they um, invited them to spend a week uh, in a specially conducted, specially designed home out in the country, it was in America. Uh, but they redesigned the home so that every single item in the home, everything about the home, uh, was retrofitted to 1959, 20 years earlier. And among other things, the men were also told to uh, live their lives as though it were 1959. So last year was 1958. The radio they listened to, the books they read, the magazines that were on the shelves, etc., etc. Every single thing had been redesigned, retrofitted back to 1959. They were told to talk in the first person, in the present tense, as though it was 1959. Uh, now, I'm simplifying this uh, fascinating study, but what they found was really quite amazing. This is just one week in these men's lives. And before going into it, they conducted a whole range of studies, uh, a whole range of, uh, sorry, of assessments, uh, physical assessments, psychological assessments. Uh, and in fact, to be honest, when they started to do these assessments, they started to worry because these, uh, many of these men were quite, um, uh, quite dysfunctional. Uh, they weren't really able to live independently. In fact, many of the children of these people uh, came in and expressed concerns about how they'd be able to cope. 
And so the investigators started to have second thoughts, but they figured they'd go ahead with it. They said, look, we, nothing really bad can happen. The worst thing is I'll have a bit of a holiday. Long story short is something did happen, something fantastic, something really, really quite exciting. When they measured, when they followed these men up a week or two later, they had significant statistically and functionally significant improvements on all of these measures. They'd lost weight, they'd, uh, they had greater dexterity in their hands, more flexibility, improved concentration, improved IQ, improved, me improved memory. This is just in one week. And this came to be known again as the psychology of possibility. If we can turn back the mind, can we turn back the body? Well, the answer was almost pretty resoundingly yes. And this has subsequently been replicated in many, many other studies in many other ways. <laughs> Mary Dixon became a pilot at the age of 50. Francis Chichester sailed around the world when he was 52. He did this alone. Henry J. Heimlich developed his emergency manoeuvre at the age of 54. At the same age, Anthony Hopkins received his first Oscar. George Burns received his when he was 80. Daniel Defoe wrote Robinson Crusoe at the age of 59. John Glenn went to space again when he was 77 years old. The average Nobel Prize winner is 63 years old. Theodore Mommsen received it at the age of 85. Taichi Igarashi climbed Mount Fuji and next year turned 100, then climbed it again. As for me, I'm 29 years old and I haven't done anything that I'd be proud of, yet. And because of these people, I know that I still have time. I guess I shouldn't waste it. Life is not divided into episodes. It's hot, like a film I'm trying to write right now. Contrary to popular belief, people don't have best before dates. My grandmother just started dating again. Her new boyfriend is 89. No matter how old you are, you live. Now I... <laughs> I don't actually have a problem worshipping youth. I think uh, I, I'm amazed by uh, the younger generation and I'm amazed by my kids and some of what, what their friends are doing and some of the social movements that are happening now that are particularly promoted by younger people. But, but that doesn't mean that we can't worship older people because many of those myths and misconceptions uh, are really unhelpful for all of us involved. And, and as we saw there, um, there's no reason why we can't. In fact, many, many people do achieve their best in their latter years. Why? Because although there's been this idea that we physically deteriorate, and I don't actually even accept that now, I think a lot of that is, um, uh, is actually untrue and unsupported, it doesn't have to happen. Um, what we sometimes forget is that there's actually growth through ageing, there's matur maturation. Uh, we, we, we find advanced wisdom uh, that we don't have in our youth, and these things are often forgotten about. So what I'd like to almost finish with is a couple of simple strategies. Um, what can we actually all do? Because it is simple. Uh, one of the sparks for my new book actually came about from some research I heard about uh, at a TED conference a couple of years ago uh, about an Australian scientist who's living in America uh, researching that um, uh, the very sexy drug that all the journalists like, resveratrol, which came out of the red, it's a, the red wine drug that many of you might have heard of. Um, the unfortunate reality is uh, that hasn't been as successful as many of us would have liked or as many of the scientists would have hoped. Um, and it's many, many years, or if, if it does become, uh, you know, get to the uh, shelves of our pharmacies, it's going to be many, many years away before it's a, a product that you and I can, can take. So in the meantime, we've just got to drink red wine. Uh, or, <laughs> or we can actually you do other things that are available right here and now and that have been proven to work. Many of these things have come from studying what's been what have become to be known as the blue zones. These are hot spots around the world, uh, probably the most famous of which is Okinawa, an island off Japan, um, but it was also Sardinia, and as you can see, a few of those places around the world, where we have significantly higher proportions of, of centenarians, of older people, and significantly lower rates of some of the illnesses and diseases that we sometimes associate with age. So what scientists have done, and, and anthropologists and sociologists, a range of people have done, uh, is to study these people. What are they actually doing? How do these people live so long and so well? And the good news is, we've learned a lot from them. And they're simple things, again, simple things that you and I and everyone that we can do, our parents, we can do these things, and the sooner we start, then the better. It's never too late. Every day we do these things, we uh, advance our tomorrow. Uh, one of the things we know, particularly in Okinawa, is they have a purpose. We've, you've sort of heard a lot about this at these conferences, and it's a simple thing, but they've got a reason for getting out of bed every morning. 
Uh, and they're also valued by their community. The older people aren't shunned and put away in a corner. They're actually revered and respected. People go to them for advice. Uh, and that's part of their purpose as well, is to share their experience and their wisdom. They also eat well. I mean, again, this is simple, simple stuff. But they also eat not much. So the simple rule, and this is, again, no matter what your age you are, eat real food, predominantly plant-based, and not much of it. The Okinawans have this philosophy where they eat their 80% full. And mindful eating, which you heard about earlier, is also a part of that. In Sardinia, in Italy, they're famous for enjoying their eating. It's a part of enjoying the process, but also being mindful, so they don't overeat. Exercise, and I don't necessarily mean just going to the gym every day like some of us enjoy, and I certainly enjoy that, but what we've found in a lot of these communities, which are predominantly farming communities, is that they're active continuously all day long. They don't necessarily go to the gym, they don't necessarily run marathons, but they just move a lot. They very rarely sit down, whether it's their old-style cooking habits or the farming habits or etc. They're also very, very, have very, very strong communities with a sense of connectedness, a sense of belonging, and particularly, as I said, the older members of those communities are valued. Very, very valued, and this is important. And then finally, and this is just a brief summary, they keep themselves mentally active. My mother plays bridge several times a week. Uh, what we know is that the more you use it, the more you won't lose it. Uh, so whether it's bridge or learning new languages or studying, these are things we can all do to keep our brains active, just like we need to keep our bodies active. And interestingly, if we put those last three things together, exercise, socializing, mentally active, we can come up with one activity, which the research has shown is profoundly effective and helpful and can prevent dementia and Alzheimer's, and that is dance. Dancing is one of the most therapeutic and healthy things we can do. It's partly a physical exercise. It's typically socializing because we're interacting with others. And we have to keep, if we think about old style dancing particularly, our minds active by remembering their moves. So if you think you're too old to dance, just check this out. Oh, this is weird. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Actually reminds me of a little Britain sketch. That I did. <laughs> Please, could I have your names? I'm Paddy. Yeah, I'm Nico. And um, what is the nature of your relationship? It's it's a um, professional one. And m might we ask you your age? I will be 80 this July. Do you think you can win this show? Oh, it would be very nice, but just as long as people enjoy what we're doing and we give people pleasure, that's the main thing. OK, well, best of luck. Shut up, man! Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. 
you've probably heard the saying, life's not about waiting for the storm to pass, it's about dancing in the rain. You can now take that quite literally. Thanks for listening. <laughs>